Hey everyone, I'm Mark Sargent and this is Flat Earth Q&A, emails number 120, where you send me your Flat Earth questions to msargent23 at comcast.net. That's M-S-A-R-G-E-N-T 23 at comcast.net and I'll do my best to answer it. Let's get right to it. This one's called the, uh, it's way too long to open up the first email. Holy smokes, that thing's huge. And there's almost no page breaks, uh, so I'm not going to choose that one. <laughs> uh, let's do a really short one. Let's do, this one's called No Wonder by Anne. It is an attachment. It's just an image, and she says there's uh, there's um, seven different levels of secrecy. It starts, it's a little drawing with boxes, and it says uh, confidential, above that is secret, then top secret, then SCI, then Q, then 9-11 truther, then flat earth. Flat earth is the, the top of the um, pyramid. And um, let's get to this one. This one's called new convert to flat earth theory. Hello, Mark. My name is Nicholas Kloster. Thank you for your videos. They have really helped me make a decision about flat earth theory. Long story short, I am a photographer and my favorite thing to shoot is the sky. The sky is my television, my love. Anything celestial is my passion. I have seen things. I have always questioned the sky. I have been studying it for years. I shoot a lot of Milky Way and star photos. I have an app I purchased to help me plan shoots, knowing in advance where certain celestial objects will be. In my app, if you position yourself on the North Pole, the stars rotate around you perfectly. The North Star, Polaris, is directly above, like a carousel, the spin around you 360 degrees. What a coincidence. I thought, odd. How does that happen? When the moon and sun rise and set, they are always way bigger around the horizon, slowly getting smaller as they rise to the top of the apex, then repeat on their way back down. Constellations do this too. How can the constellations do this as well? I asked myself, odd. I was researching Admiral Byrd and Operation High Jump when I stumbled onto one of your videos. I'm not sure if you are familiar with Admiral Byrd's Secret Diary released in 1996. Yes, I am, as a matter of fact. Or what your take is on it, but I made an observation. Admiral Byrd's account of the Crystal Palace and Beans is very much like the Book of Enoch, and Enoch's account of being taken into the heavens. Very, very similar. Thank you for your videos. I appreciate how you ask people to think for themselves and make their own decisions. Very true in today's world. Thank you, Nick. Cool. Thanks, Nick. This one's called That Which We Dare Not Mention. Mark just watched your doc on YouTube. First one I've seen in this area of knowledge. What sparked your journey and what else should I feed this very confused brain, clueless but curious, Jessica. And I thanked Jessica, and I pretty much sent her the short list, flatter short list for new people, which anyone can go to YouTube and check it out. It's a playlist I put on my channel, and it's a bunch of different YouTube content creators that talk about Flat Earth. And uh, I picked only the ones, the introductory ones. So that's that's what I usually point people at. I also, of course, point people at the documentary Behind the Curve, which you can pick up on iTunes and Amazon Prime and uh, YouTube and Google Play at the moment. So thank you for that. This one's called Conclusions About Flat Earth. Mr. Sargent, I am a journalism student at UC Irvine, and I'm working on a story about the Flat Earth Movement for a writing workshop. I was wondering if you could be, would be willing to be interviewed. Besides speaking about your beliefs, I would really be interested to know how and when you began your beliefs about Flat Earth. Thanks for any help you can provide. And that's from Doris at, out at UC Irvine. And so, yeah, I will be, as a matter of fact, talking with her tomorrow. Uh, this email came in a little while ago, and uh, I contacted her, and so we're going to be doing an interview, and as you guys know, if I can record it, I do, and I put it up on my channel, and uh, we've done several hundred on these so far. I've actually lost track of, of the total number of interviews, because I couldn't record all of them, so thank you for that. This one's called View of Globe. Dear Mark, a thought. Why is it that we always receive photos and live footage of Earth in an upright position? 
Outer space supposedly has no up or down, there is no atmosphere, and it's just a vacuum. So images of Earth from outer space aren't obliged to look like our plastic globe models from a north and south pole. Please see the attachment below, with, which demonstrates my point. Thank you. Regards, Naomi. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, we, we only, they only show us image because that's what the general population is used to. That's what we're conditioned to watch, where the United States is, the, is in the top, the Northern Hemisphere, and uh, the Africa and South America and Australia are in the Southern Hemisphere. And we, we don't ever see it shot from the side. We don't see it sideways. We only see the satellites like they're, they're traveling around like it's an upright globe on somebody's desk. Absolutely right. And that's done very, very deliberately because you don't want to confuse people. It's bad enough that you're trying to convince them of the globe. You don't want to confuse them by shooting it sideways. Although there should be satellites traveling in many different directions, right? Shouldn't there be? Maybe? Just a thought. This one's called The Curtain Comes Down on the New Shepard Rocket. Please, Mark, check this guy out. Hilarious content. All the best, Eric. And there's a YouTube link. Let me see. I think I took a look at this one. It's a seven-minute video from Level Earth Observer. Uh, I just subscribed to him. I just gave it a thumbs up. And The Curtain Comes Down on the New Shepard Rocket. Yeah. Awesome. So check that out if you get a chance. Moving on. This one's called Hello from Europe. Hello, Mark. My name is Marco. I live in both Sweden and Spain, and I understand that the Earth is flat. I've spent the last six months reading, watching, listening, and thinking about this. I just want to say hello and thank you for all your work on the truth of our Earth and all your courage. I don't know if it's courage. Uh, best regards, Marco. Yep. Thank you for that, Marco. Really appreciate it. This one's called Requesting Guide. Hi, Mark. I caught the end of the Flat Earth and Other Hot Potato Show today, and you were talking about your end of the world survival guide, and it sounds like a lot of apocalyptic fun. <laughs> Actually, it is. So, if you could please email me one. Thanks, Elizabeth Awake, a.k.a. Lori. And, yeah, if you guys want, uh, I made a end-of-the-world survival guide. Uh, it's made for, you don't even have to prep, necessarily, to, to get some use out of this. It's called Empty Shelves. I wrote it after the whole Katrina debacle. And it's about 100 pages long. It's absolutely free. And uh, I think it comes in at about a meg Maybe or just maybe not maybe in a couple megs. Anyway, I can just email it. So all you have to do is send me an email. Say I want your survival guide because the end of the world is coming. The end is nigh, and I will send it to you. This one's called Challenger Disaster Update. Um, uh, Mark, credit where credit is due. Jera might be right about this Challenger disaster thing. Oh, yeah. Somebody sent me a thing where uh, it was somebody who, who talked to astronauts said, I won't even, I won't even give you the, the link to the video where he was saying, oh, yeah, the Challenger actually happened. No, I'm not saying the Challenger didn't blow up. That's not what I'm saying. The, from 1986, if, you, if you're old enough to remember this. I'm not saying the shuttle didn't blow up. I'm just saying there weren't any astronauts inside. That's all. Nothing nothing really more to it. I, I don't care if you have other astronauts that come forward and say, oh, no, it absolutely happened. It's like, sorry, because all your witnesses supposedly died. So I don't care if it's the word of a guy who's running a console down in NASA control at the control center or if it's somebody that turned a wrench and built part of the fuel system. Doesn't really matter because it blew up and you say all the astronauts died. And we say they didn't. Moving on. This one's called Sundials. Hi, Mark. I've been diving into Flat Earth for about two months and I've been able to find answers to most of my questions from your YouTube videos and others, plus some lively discussions in Facebook groups. But when it comes to the Sundial, I'm not finding anything except from Globies saying they don't work on the Flat Earth model. Can you help? Here's an interesting GE video using an interactive website to create a paper sundial for either hemisphere. Thank you, Shelley McDaniels. No, I'm not. Look, sundials work. Of course they do. That's not the question. The question is, how far up is the sun? And, and even your best globalists will tell you this, and that is it all comes down to um, perspective and proportions, meaning the sun, to create a, a light source, this yes, the sun could absolutely be uh, hundreds of thousands of miles wide and 93 million miles away, or 
you could get the same sort of lighting effect if it was much, much closer and much, much smaller. That's why Hollywood lighting systems work as well as they do, because you can simulate this just perspective is a really, really tough thing for people, but you got to get that through your head. And that is you can make things smaller. Okay, here's a perfect example. And I'm sorry, I can't believe I forgot about this until about just now, which is okay. If you put a pen and you put, we all did this when we were kids, right? Take a pen and you hold it really close to your eye. I don't care if it's a pen. It could be your phone. It could be a battery. It could be whatever it is. I don't really care. If you hold it really, really close to your eye, right? Is it really close to your eye or is it really huge? You know, it's that whole uh, comedy skit. I'm crushing your head. I'm crushing because you're making your fingers really, really huge and you can crush anything because your fingers are really huge. Are your fingers gigantic? Are they bigger than the target or are they just really close to your eye? Well, of course, they're really close to your eye. That's because you know what your fingers look like. You know you know the, the definitions. You take any object that's generic, like, I don't know, a, just a random sphere. You hang it off in the distance. You don't know how far away it is. We Human beings have a really, really tough uh, time at, at determining this, uh, not just relative motion, but relative size. One more uh, quick example of that would be, and I love using this, this is the, uh, the Pirates of the Caribbean reference. If you've ever been to the Pirates of the Caribbean ride down in Disneyland, down in Los Angeles, I highly recommend it. Uh, you get out to the last part of that ride and there's a boat, there's a ship off in the distance that's, that's firing cannons at the shore, right? Well, that boat, you know, the way they've got it set, the way they've got it built, you know, in the darkness and the horizon line off in the distance, you don't know. You cannot tell how far away that boat is. Now, of course, realistically, you're saying, well, it can't be three or four miles away because it's obvious the, the ride isn't that big. It's, it's probably only 50 yards away, 100 yards away. You don't know. And that is because we just have a really bad time. We believe, our eyes believe what what they're shown to us. And in that case, it's a very small ship and it's not that very far away. Same sort of thing. Very false, very small sun, not very far away. Hopefully that helps Shelly. Moving on. This one's called Antarctica Midnight Sun. Hi, Mark. Mark from Marysville here. National Geographic was once called Harper's Magazine. I used to have a whole collection from the 1890s. I was told that it later became National Geographic. Just saying. Yeah, good point. Uh, National Geographic, who, as you know, interviewed myself uh, recently and down at the Salton Sea and at a meetup in Arcadia, California. They hate us. And that's because they're one of... I think they're probably the oldest science magazine that, that's still that's still going nowadays. And they were going to make a hit piece on us. And I, it was pretty much what I expected. You know, we, we filmed with them for three days and they only used about 10 minutes of it. And they got rid of almost anything that was even remotely controversial uh, and played ominous music about around me and tried to make me the villain if they could. It was amazing how much footage, though, they did not use. I mean, we talked for hours and hours and hours. And they just were not going to let my points get across at all. So I have mixed feelings about those guys. All right. So this one's called SpaceX Hopper. Mark, do you think NASA rockets would fall over like the BFR Hopper that SpaceX made? Apparently it fell apart with the wind. I think it's why NASA launches when there's no wind because they are not real rockets, only big fireworks. And that's from uh, James. Yeah, yeah. I, if you guys want to look up something, look up the SpaceX hopper rocket that supposedly fell over in a windstorm. When, when why, why would a rocket fall over in, the, in a windstorm? A couple, couple things there. Uh, one, we tie down just about everything, even planes, because they're aerodynamic, of course, and so are rockets. Uh, we t when, when a high windstorm is going to come through an airport where there's planes on the ground, they tie them down. I mean, not, not the big jets, but the small jets uh, and, the, uh, and, the, and the propeller craft, or prop, prop planes, I should call them. Uh, they tie them down. So why wasn't it tied down? Why did it fall over? Uh, you know, what's it made out of? Interesting, interesting stuff. So check that out if you get a chance. This one's called Calvin and Hobbes decal. Mark, I heard, heard you liked Calvin and Hobbes from an interview you recently did. So I made this new decal and sent you a couple. I may have sent you stickers before I forget, but I'm the guy who does decals. I was at FE 2018 and missed you, but... Uh, I'm thinking about going to the Question Everything conference, and maybe I'll see you there. I sent you a small package with some new FE decals. Keep it flat. And that's from Carson. 
And let me view his image, which he sent. Oh, yeah, it's Calvin taking a whiz on a globe. Uh, you guys probably remember the Calvin and Hobbes logos that were, um, you know, where he's taking a whiz on the Ford logo or taking a whiz on a Chevy logo. And it's really, really cool. And I will probably mention this on Flatter Than Other Hot Potatoes, but it's called Finishing Touch Vinyl Art. And you can, get, you can buy it on Etsy.com. It's also on eBay. And the guy's name is Carson Kendall. Let me see if I can find his business card here. And his phone number is 503-476-6222. And it's at finishingtouch28 at gmail.com. He's got cool little um, flat earth images and stickers and stuff. So I will, I will also read this on... Um, Flatter than other hot potatoes. So thank you for that. I'll, I, will, I will show them off. So thank you for that, Carson. It's awesome. This one's called The Earth's Curvature Equation is Wrong. Okay. And I know I'm going to bore you guys with some math. So if you're thinking about actually just zoning out while I read this, feel free. Hey, Mark, what do you think about this? This is what I posted on Nathan Thompson's site. Personally, I think it makes a lot of sense. As, as, the, matter, as the matter of the fact... <laughs> Jaron Campanella was entertaining the similar idea about two years ago, and for whatever reason, he abandoned it. Let me know what you think. Thanks, and have a great day. Uh, okay, so, I, again, there'll be some math in here, but just bear with me. To all my fellow Flat Earthers, it is time to finally put the globe theory to rest and kill the globe once and for all. It amazes me that no one in the community never questioned the way the alleged curvature of the Earth is actually calculated. Why would you trust the mainstream method that was provided by the same Masonic-controlled education system that lies about the shape of the Earth in the first place? The whole curvature calculation is a Masonic deception. Eight inches is a uh, 0.666 of one foot and the curvature for 10 miles is 66.6 feet. Again, 666 is coming into, into the play. Uh, why would we trust the Freemasons and Luciferians? What is the right way of calculating the curve? The equation eight inches per mile squared simply doesn't work because you get different value of the curvature for each mile and is getting progressively larger with the distance. It is eight inches for the first mile, but for the second mile it'll be 24 inches and the third 40 inches. Uh, and so on and so on. According to this equation, the curvature for each individual mile would be greatly different and progressively getting worse. Uh, in ideal circle, if divide, sorry, I'm reading this as is, guys. If divide the circle in equal distances of one mile, for example, the curvature from one mile to the second should be the same. No, no. <laughs> no, okay. Uh, well, I'll keep reading this and I'll, then I'll correct him at the end. That equation simply doesn't work. Uh, if you would just try to put this on paper and drew two X and Y axis, uh, X being the distance and Y for the curvature of the line, you would you would drew, you would have a parabolic progression. Again, you're losing the audience right away. There's people that are listening to me right now going, <laughs> seriously, you're not going to be able to help them with math. And, and, by, and to the same token, uh, you're not going to be able to uh, convince people of the globe with math. But I will keep reading this. Uh, the answer is much simpler and way easier to do. Uh-huh. <laughs> we'll see. Because I don't think you're going to be able to do it. The whole secret lies in the value of pi. So, yeah, you see, you lost them. People do not. You, you, you go up to somebody on the street and you go 3.14159. They're not going to know what you're talking about. I appreciate that you're in math, but you are not going to be able to go anywhere with this. Pi means nothing to 99% of the population. Sorry. Uh, but I'm, again, we'll keep... We'll finish this thing. Pi is nothing else but a ratio that the Earth has to curve for every unit of the distance. It is simply the relation of the circumference of the diameter of the Earth and tells you what ratio the surface has to curve to go around full 360 to form the full circle. Let's say you want to know what would be the curvature for one mile if we were living in reality. On the ball, you simply divide one mile by the value of pi. One mile, one mile equals five. Wow. One mile equals five thousand two hundred eighty feet um, divided by three point one four equals one six eight one point five or you can do it one my equals three point one four uh, equals point three one eight times fifty two eighty equals one thousand six hundred eighty one point five feet yes if we truly lived on the ball the curvature for every individual mile would have to be almost seventeen hundred feet no no <laughs> no no it cannot killing me it works also, this is why you cannot beat anything with just straight up math. 
uh, I'm sorry, it also works on the graphics. No, it doesn't. If you drew X and Y axis and let's say one inch would be equivalent of one mile on your graphic presentation, you would start making dots corresponding to curvature for every next inch on your drawing. You would actually see what you were drawing a circle. What I'm saying is that the value of the curvature of the whole globe would simply be simply its diameter for half a globe it would be its radius and so on they lie about the equation calculation because the curvature would have to be much greater for the earth to be a ball they want to hide the fact and, and adjust the calculation to what we actually can see with our eyes which is almost no curvature for the first three miles and anyone knows there is none and things disappear from the bottom not because of the curvature but due to the way how pers perspective works optical limitations of our eyes and other optical illusions they also want to incorporate their favor number in it and put in the Satanist tramp stamp, Satan's approved on it. So there's no physical experiments necessary. Simple math says it all. It kills the globe. Okay, and that's from Eric. Uh, and it's spelled A R E K. Uh, Eric, I appreciate your email, uh, but sorry, the, the math is not that exaggerated. It's just not. Uh, the eight inches per mile, per mile squared works just fine for uh, upwards of the first what, three five hundred miles, and then yeah, afterwards you have to take into some 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 fancy geometry to to make it more exaggerated. But it is not seventeen hundred feet per mile. Sorry, there's no way, no way, no way. If it was seventeen hundred feet per mile, uh, things it would you got to do the. 1,700 feet per mile, the, the whole, it would, you would basically have the uh, Lake Pontchartrain. In fact, even the Lake Pontchartrain image, which is exaggerated in itself, wouldn't be even remotely close to 1,700 feet per mile. So, sorry. Thank you again. I, lo I love the fact that Flat Earth is having you question things. And I, again, I love the question everything. But in this case, no, it's, it's too exaggerated. Your math is, is, is way too blown out of proportion. So thank you for that, and again, appreciate everybody for bearing with me on this one. This one's called Survival Guide. I always love Survival Guides. They're so easy. In fact, there's no body of the email. It just says Survival Guide, please. Thanks, Mark. And that's from D. McKenna. And yeah, see so if you guys want Survival Guide, that's all you have to do. You don't even have to, you don't even have to say hi to me, although it's nice and probably polite if you do say hi and say, Hey, Mark, could I have the Survival Guide? This one's called Antarctica Midnight Sun. <clears throat> hey, Mark, I hope you won't be mad at me, but I went on NASA's Facebook site and in their comment section posted Flat Earth Clues number 13 for want of a nail. I would love to see their faces. Excellent argument. And that's uh, from uh, Mark. Cool. No, you can post anything. On my behalf, you can post anything you want. Any of my content you can put on anybody's Facebook or you can tweet it or you can put it in their forum section. I don't care where you, where you put it. Feel free. Just throw my stuff out there. Uh, you can even take my clues and put it on your own channel if you want. I will not put up a fight. This one's called Euclid's Postulate Number 5 and Flat Earth. Mark never gave this much thought but went down a video rabbit hole tonight and came across this five-part series titled... Non-Euclidean Geometry, published by Extra Credits. All one word. Link below. Anyway, among all the other FE work you have to do, I'd be interested to see if your reaction to this is the same as mine. If the interest, In the interest of time, I'll get the linchpin piece for me. Euclid had five postulates, which are essentially true observable natural phenomenon. They are the basis for all geometry. The video series focuses on how Postulate 5 never sat right with the mathematicians that followed, believing it should be provable. Sidebar, geometry starts with these postulates, and then by applying proofs of things to other proofs, you build an entire framework. So Postulate 5, being one of the five bedrock observable assumptions of geometry, says that two lines that are both right angles to a perpendicular line are parallel to each other. And that those parallel lines will never cross no matter how far out you go. The video series for four of five videos talks about how Postulate 5 could never be proven, leaving the Euclidean premise intact. In other words, I can observe it's true and all others can observe that truth independently. Then in video five, more or less non-Euclidean geometry comes in and says, well, if a plane upon which your lines are drawn are curved, this could cause parallel lines to cross. And the example that backs it up, you guessed it, longitudinal, 
longitudinal lines are parallel, but on a sphere they converge at the poles. So there you go. Postulate 5 only works on a flat surface. Hmm. Euclid. Thing I can observe is true and is self-evident. Non-Euclid. Incredibly complicated theory of time-space is one thing. Curved space due to gravity and proof that all these time-space curves must be true and postulate 5 disproved on a globe. Postulate 5. More proof that the Earth is what you see it is. Hmm. That is really interesting. I had never gotten something like that before. Thanks. And that's uh, from a guy named DJ. Thank you, DJ. This one's called Global Eviction. Mark, February 1, 2019. I just evicted a filthy globe believer. Put her on the street, dead of winter. Cost me $900. Best money I ever spent. Never mind, she was three months delinquent. The story is better without mentioning it. Why? Why would it better? Uh, and then he sent me a link to the, his rental property. <laughs> well, look, I mean, it doesn't matter uh, if, if the person was a globe believer or non-globe believer necessarily. Uh, but if they're three months late on their rent, uh, generally, yeah, that's, that's, that's the tipping point for most people. Landlords, I was a landlord for a number of years out in Boulder, Colorado. And um, yeah, three months, that's, that's about it. That's usually when you say, okay, gotta go. And usually build that into the lease. So, and so thank you for that, I guess. Cool. Justice was done in a small way. I don't think against globalists. Uh, now, if she was fighting us, if she was an active person that was making videos against us, then it would probably be more satisfying. But um, this one's called Cold Moonlight. Mark, first, thanks for all your work and putting yourself out there, although I came to Flat Earth through a different route. I enjoyed learning from your questions. With that, I was listening to one of your shows with Patricia, and just b briefly, the cold light from the moon came up, and a thought occurred to me. What if the moon isn't giving off light, but instead is absorbing it and glowing? Which I mean is like a glow-in-the-dark sticker or t-shirt I had when I was a kid, when you put it in the sun, it charges up and then glows. I'm not suggesting that the sun is charging the sun. The sun is char okay. The sun is charging the moon. You should have said moon necessarily. Although perhaps it may explain what the moon phases don't always seem to line up with the position of the sun. But what if the material of the moon is made to absorb energy from the Earth, resulting in colder temperatures? So the sun and the moon kind of work like a yin yang. Well, definitely that. Uh, one heating up the surface and the other cooling to help maintain a balance. Yeah, I, I, I'll go with that. Uh, I don't have any kind of model for this at all, and it may be a stupid idea altogether since I'm probably missing something simple, but it was just a thought. What do you think? What am I missing? Again, thanks, Miles. Uh, no, Miles, I, I don't think you're you're really missing that much. I don't think the moon is absorbing light from something else. I mean, it, uh, I, mean I suppose it could be suck, soaking up some energy uh, that the sun left behind, possibly, but you didn't, you wouldn't necessarily have to. I mean, if it was a self-contained, uh, uh, self-illuminating light source, you wouldn't necessarily have to do that. I mean, it doesn't have to be recycling energy. I suppose it'd be somewhat efficient, but you don't have to. But but thanks for that. This one's called... Video from Apollo Lunar Lander. Hey, Mark, I just heard your comment about the Apollo mission transmitting video. You mentioned that they were transmitting at 30 frames per second from the moon, and you raised some question about whether that was possible. I've been trying to find some fr some 30 frames per second video from the Apollo mission, but so far all I can find is 10 frames per second slow scan television video that has been scanned converted to 30. You know what? I think you got a point there. Do you know where I might find some of the 30 frames per second video from the Apollo moon mission lander uh, when it was on the moon that hasn't been converted from 10 frame slow scan video? You may be interested to know that according to what I've been able to gather, the video being sent from the moon to Earth on the Apollo mission was actually slow scan television signal, 10 frames per second, and was scan converted to 30 frames per second on the ground so that it could be broadcast on regular 30 frame uh, television. The story is that they just pointed a 30 frame camera at the 10 frame slow scan video monitor that was shown in the Apollo video feed. As to the difficulty in getting a radio signal from the moon to the earth, it was significant feat if indeed, if it indeed happened. The story is that they they had fuel cells that ran on liquid hydrogen and oxygen on the lunar lander. While expensive, fuel cells are very powerful so that they would have had a reasonable quantity of power on board. But still, they were probably transmitting hundreds of watts, not thousands. But the story is that they made up for this by using directional high-gain antennas uh, so the lunar 
lander which concentrated the power they did have to go more towards earth then on earth they used a 200 foot wide parabolic dish to gather as much stronger signals so that they would have been otherwise possible i think that if you did the math with antenna gains and the like you would see that it all works out of course that doesn't mean we went to the moon but i don't think that is a smoking gun trying to help us concentrate on the smoking gun without getting distracted with things that make us look silly all the best jesse okay a couple things first off you're you're probably right they probably were uh, doing the 30 frames conversion so but even 10 frames per second and that's still a lot 10 frames per second in 1969 from the moon look look they did not have enough wattage 250,000 miles is a huge distance to transmit anything if it's not on cable. It's, it's, it's a massive, massive distance. Uh, huge, huge amounts. And, and again, 10 frames per second. Clear 10 frames per second. Where, you know, with almost pinpoint accuracy. And I don't care if it was a 200-foot dish. You're aiming at a 200-foot dish. You're not going to be able to get that much signal in. And remember, it not only is it crossing a quarter million miles, it's also going through, if you believe it, the Van Allen radiation belts, which is this high, high, intense radio wave area with massive amounts of radiation in it. And, and again, you're going through this with, with virtually no static at all. How are you doing that? How are you doing that? And the, 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 the best one I ever saw was the... Um, I remember you doing this in color. On top of it, with sound, was when the uh, the Apollo, the, the capsule lifted off from the ground and you were getting panning. So then you're going back and forth. Not only are you getting, because they said that Houston was remote controlling that camera, remote controlling that camera far, from a quarter million miles away. And they said, oh, there was like an eight second delay and we caught it just perfectly. And they had it tilt up, just, just perfect with color. And again, no distortion at all. No, 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 no. They just, people just bought it. It's like, oh yeah, we got the tech to do it. And again, if enough people in white coats say they have the tech to do it, and then they show an image like, oh, see, we're doing it. People don't question it. Say, oh, wow, we, we must we must have the tech to do it. No, but but I do agree. I will give you this. The the 10 frames per second that was, that was upsampled to 30 so that it could be broadcast on television, you're probably right. Probably right. Thank you for that. And that's from Jesse. This one's called, happy to see you both back together again. Dear Mark and Patricia, I'm very pleased to see you both back together again on The Secret Show. So happy you patched things up. I want to give glory to God for this is an answered prayer. I don't know if you agree or not, but I consider it thus. <laughs> you two make a great team. I am happy for you both. Steve from Minnesota. Thank you, Steve. Yes, it's always fun working with Patricia. And again, for, for those of you who don't know the inside scoop, I've never, never had a beef with her about anything. And the Denver thing had nothing to do with her. Uh, it was strictly a thing on my side. And I apologize to no end in writing to her. So uh, we're fine. This one's called, good evening. No, I'm sorry, it's called Columbia Flat Earth. Good evening, Mr. Sergeant. My name is Juan... It took me eight months to realize that the earth is certainly flat. It was not an easy process, but finally the truth dispelled the darkness after 10 months. Watching videos and learning every single day about the flat earth now, I am more, <clears throat> excuse me, more than sure about the real shape of the earth as well as the conspiracy behind it pulling the threads of ignorance to keep the blindness of the masses. Here in my country, there's not too many people aware of this amazing truth, and the reason why I'm writing to you is because I can translate your videos, Flat Earth Clues, to Spanish language, literally word by word. I propose you this. Honestly, it will be privileged for me if you give me the opportunity to do that. I, I will let the link of the original video in English on the details of the video and your name on it. I'll use my own voice in to dubbing your voice. I'll be waiting for your response. God bless you uh, to your family. I send you a big hug from the distance. I admire a lot of what you're doing. Sincerely, Juan Pablo uh, Argelis, a simple Colum Colombian flat earther. Did I respond to him? I did not. So that's going to go in my to-do pile. This one's called Flat Earth VR. Good afternoon, sir. I'm building a Flat Earth VR community app. A safe place where like-minded people connect, play, explore, and better represent how they view the world. Please let me know what you think. 
and he's got a link to it. And it's a video unavailable, and the account tied to it has been terminated. Awesome. That's from Ethan. I don't know what Ethan was doing, but apparently YouTube did not like it very much. This one's called Moon Landing Solved. Mark, I'm open-minded about the Earth being flat, but I do agree the moon landing was faked. I'm confident that they went there, but they had to fake the footage because there was no way they could broadcast live from the moon in 1969 with the limited power and computer power they had to transmit. And that's from James. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, look, if you don't believe in the moon landing, that's a great start. After that, it's just a slippery slope and a couple bus rides and a cab ride to Flat Earth. This one's called... Inmate, and I will not list the inmate's name. This is the first one of these. I thought it was I thought it was a scam initially, but after the whole um, uh, law enforcement thing that I dealt with recently, uh, I realized this is not a scam. Uh, this is a system-generated message informing you that the above-named person is a federal prisoner who seeks to add you as his or her contact list for exchanging electronic messages. There is no message from the prisoner at this time. You can accept this prisoner's request or block this individual or all federal prisoners from contacting you via electronic messaging at corelinks.com. To register with Corelinks, you must enter the email address that received this notice along with the identification code below. And it has my email address and then a code that they generate and expires in 10 days. By approving electronic correspondence with federal prisoners, you consent to have the Bureau of Prisons staff monitor the content of all electronic messages exchanged. Uh, yeah, duh. Uh, once you have registered with Core Links and approved the prisoner for correspondence, the prisoner will be notified electronically. And sure enough, uh, you can check this out at C-O-R-R, otherwise, you know, current correctional links. So it's corelinks.com. I thought it was very, very interesting um, because I, I, you know, I, I get emails from all over the place, uh, various countries and various people. But this person is actually writing me from prison. And if he has a flatters question, I am going to answer it. Uh, if he's, if he's going to go that so far as to, you know, put himself, put himself out there, at least with the prison system. Honestly, I'm doing this more for the guards than anything else <laughs> because I'm sure whoever's reading this, you know, there's probably got multiple people going through these emails that are coming in and out of the prison. Uh, I'm sure somebody's going to be looking at this going, what, what is going on? So, uh, yeah, I will, I will check this out. I don't think there's going to be much to it, but Hey, I might as well see, see what they got to say. I mean, if I open my day up with flat earth, I'm open-minded all sorts of things. And if somebody from prison wants to contact me, now, depending on his crime, you know, I, I may not, there might be not a lot of dialogue. Uh, and hopefully it's nobody famous or anything like that. This one's called a Genuine Offer. Hmm. All right. Mark, I am indeed a real person and I don't have a hidden agenda. Well, we'll see about that. I have sat on the sidelines for a while now and just been absorbing the information of countless videos. I related a lot to a statement you made uh, to a recent interview with a student from University of Washington. Yeah, University of Washington. Somebody uh, from one of their departments wanted to interview me. I, I don't know how many different universities have contacted me, but there's been a number. I have a similar personality in that I am not a salesperson, but once I understand and believe in something, I can be extremely persuasive and passionate about it. Coincidentally, I also have a past working with time and attendance software. Wow, small world. Yeah, I, I worked for ADP building their time safer web application. Yeah, that is a small world because there are not a lot of people that worked in the time and attendance industry. From what I have gathered, you did training in time and attendance, but I don't believe it was an ADB product. Anyhow, I'm a globe skeptic and a software developer. I have since left the world of cubicles and TPS reports. Nice little office space reference. But I still do a lot of programming on my own. One of the things I did after becoming a flat earther was purchase a domain. The earth is not a spinning ball.com. And I learned all sorts of JavaScript to put a map on a spinning ball. I have been too busy to do anything with it, but I will get there. What I would like to offer 
help involves monitoring YouTube channel statistics. I always hear people stating that they lost subscribers and all sorts of other anomalies. I believe I could possibly help uncover some patterns or potentially verify some of these claims. I have only looked at the documentation so far, but there are many APIs available through Google that involve YouTube statistics, more specifically the reports shown here. Uh, it appears that reports can be created daily, but cannot be run beyond 60 days, and that window seems to be shrinking. However, the reports may generate CSV files. I would like to build a system that would allow those to be run each day and import them into my MySQL database. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Sorry, I'm skipping through a little bit of this. I thought about who to contact and realized it would likely I would likely be faced with people calling me a shill or assuming I was some sort of spy or Google employee. Eh, I don't know about that, but I, I don't know if we necessarily need this now. I mean, we're, we're everywhere. We, we, we were tracking the numbers all the way up until they tore them down. And, and tracking the numbers now, I, I don't know if it's going to give us that much of a benefit. Um, I will have to read the developer documentation, so on and so on. And he's just reaching out to me, seeing if I'm interested in this. All right, well, I'll write him back and see what's on his mind more than this but thank you for that this one's called why all caps with a big question mark mark can you please explain to me why governments around the world want to deceive us if you have to ask that that's your opening question you don't really know what governments do uh what is the reason for keeping the average citizens unknowing again who <laughs> I want to know where you were raised because it had to have been similar to where I was raised. Uh, what is the final achievement? Why would a government hide flat earth? What is the end game? It has to be worldwide governments, right? Somebody knows something. Tell me why. What is the objective? What are the facts? Wow, there's a lot of question marks here. I used to be a pilot. Really? <laughs> also, I have been up to 40,000 feet. So don't snow job me. Don't snow job me? Why? Just why? What is the reason of treason and deception. Ooh, the reason of treason. That's good. Uh, explain, please. And that's from Michael. Uh, come on, Michael. If, if you've gotten this far to where you've emailed me, you've got to have some sort of a clue. And not only that, but if you watch the, the Flat Earth clues at all, I mean, I, I lay it out for you. It's all about control. It's all, you can't be the ultimate power. You can't be the ultimate authority unless you're the ultimate authority. You can't be the, the most powerful government in the world and then say, oh yeah, by the way, we're living in a structure which was built by somebody bigger than us, uh, but you got to do what I say. No, it, you, your credibility, credibility gets undermined almost immediately. But thank you for that. This one's called Game and Game References. Mark, listening to the latest Flat Earth podcast and David and Matt discussed why some people are just not going to wake up, I thought maybe if you subscribe to the simulation theory, those who are not able to wake are just NPCs. And that's from Rob. Uh, yeah, I, of course I've thought about it. Uh, you know, I, I spent most of my life working or, or at least delving into the game industry. Uh, and one second. So, and NPCs, if you guys don't, if you don't know anything about the, the gaming world, it's, they stand for non-player characters. Characters that look like players, but they're just kind of walking around doing their daily grind. And they, they don't actually have a soul. Um, they are just, in fact, I, I, I don't want to go off on a rant here about why, you know, all these things. AI is just like the new buzzword over the last few years. It's like everything's got AI, artificial intelligence, which I suppose is kind of true. But when AI started out, it was it was always implied that AI was sentient beings, machines that could question their, their own reality. And that has not been created. That's not going to be created anytime soon. Uh, and I can get into that. I'll get into that or a whole nother thing. Um, the, the most, the most um, accurate description I've heard recently um, was just uh, what they call like, like smartphones. Put the word smart or automated in front of anything, that's good enough. But artificial intelligence, uh, I don't know. I think it's stretching it. I mean, again, if you guys want to embrace the artificial intelligence, then great. But that does not, artificial intelligence does not mean sentience. It doesn't mean that the, all of a sudden a toaster starts talking to you and says, why am I here? You know, or whatever. Your television starts flashing you messages like, wow, this is really strange. Artificial intelligence would be like uh, the Ultron project in the second Avengers movie. 
something like that, or uh, you know, the the ones that don't talk, like in the Terminator movie things. And I don't want to get into it anymore. Uh, so yeah, are there NPCs walking around? Yeah, prob probably sure. Uh, but I can't really get into the simulation. I'd love to talk about the simulation theory more and more. I really would, but the average person on the street does not understand code. Uh, you've got to um, you've got to know some a little bit about software development. You do. You just have to to understand that. And uh, most people don't. So I can't explain it. And I'm not going to. I mean, look, you're you're holding in your phone right now. Uh, let's round it down. A million pages of code. You don't know any of it. You just know that it works. Plain and simple. You're never going to know. And most of the people walking around, there's 6 billion smartphones out there. Nobody knows the, the code that's going through those. It's just such a small amount of, of developers out there. And unfortunately, once you get into development uh, past a certain level, you kind of, the develop the code starts affecting you and you kind of become more robot than anything else. And I don't want to get into it too much. So sorry to the developers that are listening out saying, I'm not a robot. It's like, yeah, really? Talk to me about the double slit experiment. Tell me what the world is. All right, moving on. Do a few more here. This one's called National Geographic Garbage. Hi, Mark. Hope all is well. I just watched the uh, UAP channel and saw the hit piece on Flat Earth. The video is called Irrational Geographic Quick Scopes Flat Earth. So here's my rant. Why the hell did these people continue to ignore the fact that Robert Simmons, Robert Simmons, that's the name I got to remember, admitted on video that the photos of earth are made in photoshop so what the hell is going on these people controlled are are, are retarded especially at the beginning where a man says basically all the globe photos are real clearly he is ignorant and controlled by the media makes me angry why people can see and are told the blue marble is a fake along with all the others just someone will never hand over the funds to and by the way i'm glossing over huge spelling and grammar mistakes here I mean, he obviously typed this really, really fast on his phone uh, to prove us wrong. So clearly we must be correct and the earth is flat. Uh, LOL, I had to switch off the video or, or my monitor was going to go out the window. And that was from John. Uh, yeah, um, and you know, I'll, I'll tell you a quick story about that real fast, which is, that was redundant, a quick story real fast. The Robert Simmons was the guy that built the first background for the iPhone which was a globe and it wasn't even a blue marble shot he literally because back in 2000 whatever when that first iphone was made uh he didn't there were no there were no images of the earth from space no blue marble shots there was only one and that was the 1972 apollo uh image which was obviously just airbrushed and so he had to create one from scratch and it was again really really strange he's a nasa designer and you could tell he just got lazy in the Southern Hemisphere and was just using Photoshop and, and the clone tool and just cloned all these cloud these clouds. It's like, what? Was, were you working on a whole bunch of other things? It's like, oh, you know, this is the first, and I know, it was like the first iPhone. He didn't know the iPhone was going to be this monstrous success. But it's like, you just got lazy at the end and just cloned all these clouds at the bottom. And so you can really tell. Now, what was interesting about that was that NASA embraced that image as a real image. Like it was a real thing to where when I had a chance to go to Houston, went to the NASA Space Center there with Patricia Steer, and you can you can do this right now. You can go in outside, they've got a 747 with a space shuttle on top of it. That's like their big thing, and it's really aged, and it's 30 years old. Sit so with a space shuttle on top of it, and you walk around, you will see eventually that image that's that's been blown up and put on poster board and laminated. It's literally sitting there, it is that image. It is a completely photoshopped image. So why is it sitting uh, in the marquee exhibit at the NASA Space Center? Because you don't know. All they have to do is say, oh, it's totally real. If NASA says it's real, the general public believes it. And also what was interesting was that we, Patricia and I pointed that out when we were there with the documentary team from uh, that did Behind the Curve. They, did, they left that out. They completely left that out of the movie. So I, I would have left it in. It was, come on. There's the image right there. And you and anyone can look this up. So yeah, Robert Simmons and the uh, the famous blue, fake blue marble shot. Uh, let's do a couple more. This one's called Indoctrination Images. Mark, the globe is haunting me. Regards, Captain Flatastic. And yeah, he sent me a couple images. One when he was driving through a mini mall and there was something called the Global Buffet. 
And of course, all we we know the thing's been around for a long time. World Gym. Cool. That's really awesome. So let's see if we can end on. You know what? We're gonna circle back around to this long one. And I don't think I'm gonna read the whole thing because the uh, uh, the the there's no paragraph breaks in this middle section. I mean, it is it's. I'm gonna go blind reading this, but let's try it. Um, we'll end on this. We'll, we'll spend at least five minutes on it. This one's called the Esoteric History of Planet Earth. Mark, first to understand the firmament, we need to understand God a little bit better. A good place to start reading is the exegesis of philip k dick oh yeah the guy i actually watched his series recently electric dreams i watched the entire thing um it was the second time i'd watch it it's not bad i mean it's not black mirror but it's it's pretty good it's a decent twilight zone type thing um asked me about how i discovered the existence of his book sometime about six months ago i had a hunch that the gates of solomon is actually a metaphor for the in indigenous narcotic receptors exoteric media lists opiate and the cannabinoid sites but there is scant information of the receptors that other drugs especially hallucinogens act on as such being the absolute idiot psychonaut <laughs> wow this guy writes really unusual i am uh, i decided to do a massive amount of multiple drugs simultaneously <laughs> to see what would happen okay i'm gonna read this uh something did happen something odd and terrifying i'm still debating on whether or not i am insane or i'm actually stumbling on a road that is likely going to lead me to being nailed to a cross at best or having a jesuit assassin shoot me in the back of the head at worst i chuckled after typing that but the sad truth of the matter is i'm probably right about the latter Human language has been manipulated since the time of Babel as the original language of man contained within its sound constructs, tones, and other nuances, a power that God granted and then God took away. Notice the distinction between God and God, uh, uppercase and lowercase, when spoken would simply convey information, but when sung it would resonate in a manner that would produce a sort of effects that allowed the, two, the dominant civilization from henceforth referred to as Atlantis for sake of ease to create massive stone architecture without modern equipment. They sung the stones into place. The language itself was magical in nature via some strange esoteric divinely gifted way. We did something back then at the behest of the little god that the big god didn't like and he had to bring the hammer down. So he sent his eternal champion, thanks to Moorcock for the designation, Toth, to reverse the polarity of the planet and basically uh, kick us into oblivion. This is detailed in the Emerald Tablet that when I first read it high, as a high school kid thought no more true than the Nemo ne <laughs> Necronomicon or any other pulp rag made to appeal to kids with dark black clothes, green mohawks, and combat boots. However, as an adult and having spent 20 years and as, as an agnostic, that in the last six months has become an absolute believer in higher power and a, uh, oh boy, I lost my, this is why you need paragraph breaks, guys. I look away for two seconds, higher power and a realm of understanding that our primitive third dimension centric minds can comprehend. The information in the Emerald Tablets is most likely a glimpse of the pre-flood magic science based society that formed under, under the direction of the beings of light. I am not certain if Toth is an incarnation of the Logos made flesh. Most scholars will translate the name of his alter ego Hermes uh, as the thrice greatest and state it is because he was the best in three realms of learning. But th the deeper esoteric meaning is that he is the third greatest among the hierarchy of divine entities below the God, the big God and the little God. Some believe Enoch was also an incarnation of Toth. And he acted as a mediator between the two factions of the Nephilim, Lucifer and his fallen angels, and the big god himself. Uh, let's see here. One of the spirit, blah, 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 spirit version. Some of this, sorry, I'm going to have to skip part through some of this. It gets a little floaty. Um, there's much misinformation circling out there that would take a year for me to get my thoughts down on paper on such a rational way that I do not come across as some drug-fueled mental patient. FYI, I am a plumber in real life and used to work as a computer programmer, wow, and web developer, do not focus uh, on the drug stuff too much. I only rarely and typically use it for uh, 
entheogenic exploration. I'll tell you about about some of my strainer, stranger encounters sometime. The Emerald Tablets and EXC of PKD both allude to the fact that altered states of consciousness allow sentient beings uh, to experience other locations at a distance. Even the Fed spent millions, probably billions, researching OOBE and remote viewing. Uh, that's probably, probably true. Um, this is real and more entertaining than anything Hollywood ever came up with. Interestingly enough, magic wands used to be made of the wood of the holly tree. Ah, movie magic, get it? Oh, yeah. um, these people are all around us, running society, filling our heads with bad information, manipulating us, causing wars, causing strife. Something came back around the flood when Toth was away mediating in a menti. His priests bought, brought something so evil into our dimension that he had to destroy the kingdom to prevent it from making it here completely it is here partly though it feeds on suffering uh, david ike as insane as he sounds is on the right track the bible calls it python it's something from another universe i don't think there are likely an infinite number of all powerful gods out there in the multiverse and whatever the thing is i it did not come from the big bang all right, let's see if there's anything else. Sorry, I got to wrap this up because it's just it's just so thick. You guys cannot write me super, super big emails. Um, let's see here. PK. Let's end with this. I've had so many strange experiences in my life that I have never told anyone because I don't want to be labeled a lunatic, but at this point, something had to be said. Something needs to be done. There is something very strange going on, and we are being lied to and have been lied to for thousands of years about the true history of creation and human species. I want to find out what is going on, and hopefully the knowledge of understanding the truth doesn't drive me to madness. A high-ranking deep state insider that posts on 4chan claims that mental illness, especially schizophrenia, is caused by people unlocking certain aspects of our previous ability without having the discipline to contain and control it. Yeah, I'd go with that. Uh, Google high-level insider 4chan chats sometime uh, and give it a read. Seriously interesting stuff. I am almost certain he is an Essen monk. Anyway, enough in Sandy. I need to go to bed early and fix a bunch of broken water mains in three feet of ice. Uh, tomorrow morning. Hooray. That's from Jason. Thank you, Jason. That's uh, that's awesome. A lot of stuff there. A lot of stuff to absorb. I may write back to him. We'll see. And let's just call that one good. Sorry, we ended on one that was getting way, way out there. But you know what? That happens. So thank you for everybody that uh, wrote in. Remember, you can send your emails to msargent23 at comcast.net. That's M-S-A-R-G-E-N-T 23 at comcast.net. And until next time, guys. Stay flat.